this feeling that something was terribly wrong with the world that we live in, but you couldn't figure out just what it was. And you've come to the right place. Secret societies, mystery religions, and the Illuminati have been controlling our reality since the beginning of time. But not anymore, because there is an awakening happening, and you are about to become a part of it. Good afternoon. It's Friday the 30th of September 2022, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson. Joining me on video link, uh, I've got Vanessa Bailey and uh, Patrick Henningsen. Um, OK, let's uh, get straight on, uh, everybody, with uh, with this. Um, this is Putin, who I believe at this very moment is uh, giving uh, a, his presentation, his speech uh, about the um, joining of the Donetsk uh, and Lugansk and the other two regions of the Donbass uh, to Russia. Now, this uh, screenshot was taken 48 minutes ago, so it is happening at the moment. Uh, before we move on with this, uh, Vanessa, what are your thoughts? Because you're you're just back from uh, the Donbass yourself. Uh, what are your thoughts on this announcement? Um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly going to be um, an interesting uh, historical speech. Um, most people in Russia feel that uh, now, of course, there is going to be this um, mobilization of the reservists. Now, there's been a lot of sort of um, misinformation floating around about what mobilization means. Um, but it, I, I, th I think what you're going to hear from Putin is um, confirmation that attacks from the Ukrainian ultranationalist forces and armed forces, of course, NATO proxies, um, are now against Russian territory. And so now uh, the military uh, escalation will start. Yes, uh, indeed. We'll, we'll get uh, some thoughts from Patrick in a second, but let's just have a look and see what the British government response to all this has been over the last day or so. Um, so here's Liz Truss from uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, I spoke to President Zelensky earlier to underline steadfast support in light of Russia's sham referendums. Uh, which we will never recognize. I thanked him for helping secure the release of five British nationals and discussed ways to protect Ukrainian gas supplies. Putin must fail. Um, and uh, at the OSCE, Leo Doherty, uh, who is the Minister of State for Europe, uh, said, v continuing the same themes uh, yesterday, uh, Vladimir Putin's sham referendum must be seen for what they are, a brazen and deliberate attempt uh, sorry, desperate attempt to justify an unprovoked and illegal land grab of sovereign Ukrainian territory. Uh, but no amount of Russian lies can hide what we all see plainly, a sham uh, propaganda exercise without a shred of legitimacy conducted down the barrel of a gun uh, by soldiers accompanying ballots door to door, forcing Ukrainians to vote. Uh, so the spin, the narrative from uh, the British government is that uh, the Ukrainian uh, or the uh, soldiers accompanying the ballot boxes were there to force people to vote. Uh, not there to protect uh, the people that were actually dis uh, distributing the ballots and so on. Um, so, Patrick, uh, welcome to the program. What are your thoughts on on that uh, and and on Putin's uh, announcement? <clears throat> I, uh, I'm, I'm not surprised, uh, of course, by any of the comments. Um, the the West party line is going to be categorical. Um, if you look at uh, Crimea, what are we now? Nine years in, almost nine years in. Uh, to the independence and uh, and reunification of Crimea with with Russia, uh, almost you know nine years in, and there's no recognition. Um, that's look at look at uh, Turkish Cyprus, uh, that sort of situation. Look at Kosovo, and both of those types of situations. Here we are, so many years later, uh, and the neighboring states do not recognize uh, the new state. So that. That's something just to be expected. The, the, this is where, especially in this case, the geopolitical lines are, are going to fall very hard. And I don't see in the, in the near future any recognition uh, from any Western states. The only possible way that that could happen is if it became sort of a deal, some, something that's brokered as part of a larger deal where a country would agree to recognize 
these independent states as part of the Russian Federation, uh, as independent and part of the Russian Federation. And that would be part of some broader agreement in the future. However, I don't see that happening. Look at Turkey with Cyprus, look at Kosovo, um, despite all efforts um, after all these years, um, in many cases, these, these states do not have any international recognition. Look at Iraqi Kurdistan, none of the neighbors uh, recognize it as an independent state, much to the chagrin of Washington, who carved it out of a piece of Iraq uh, many years ago by using the no-fly zone as the pretext for that process to begin. So in this case, um, this I think this is just going to be a stalemate, and it's going to be something that people are going to have to uh, compensate and work around for the foreseeable future. Uh, Vanessa? I just wanted to say, I mean, this it's quite incredible how they are misrepresenting this. This is Putin's referendum. This is the referendum for the people of Donbass that they also had in 2014. And the majority now, you know, take it back to 1991. So th this is not Russia's referendum. This is the independent referendum of the people of Donbass. And this ridiculous idea that they're being sort of forced at gunpoint to vote. I was in Donetsk. There were 133 observers from all around the world traveling to almost every polling station, both in Russia and in the Donbass territories, in all areas, under shelling, under constant shelling, by the way. In Donetsk, it was quite incredible. All you could hear was air defense and the explosion of missiles overhead for 24 hours of, of the voting. And at night, um, when the air defense sort of backed off a little bit, the actual ballot counting station where we were um, that you showed on Wednesday uh, was targeted by those missiles and, and they hit the ground. So, you know, I, I mean, honestly, the, the, the misrepresentation by Western regimes trying desperately to, to um, discredit and disappear the voice of the people of Donbass that have been asking for this for eight years. And what has been the response by Ukraine to ethnically cleanse them? This referendum is their way out of persecution and genocide. And anyone who's misrepresenting it to, to the point that these politicians and MEPs are, are, are effectively enabling uh, war crimes against the people of Donbass. Okay, thank you for that. Now let's look at uh, the latest uh, British response, uh, more sanctions. So Russian installed officials behind sham referendums in Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson and Zaporizhia uh, sanctioned. Uh, so 33 people and entities uh, is what the British government is saying. Uh, and uh, well, what can we say? Let's have a look at what James Cleverly had to say about it. And it's the same rhetoric once again. Sham referendums held at the barrel of a gun cannot be free or fair. Uh, and we will never recognize the results. Uh, they follow a clear pattern of violence, intimidation, torture, and forced deportations in the areas of Ukraine Russia has seized. Uh, today's sanctions will target those behind those sham vote votes, as well as the individuals that continue to prop up the Russian regime's war of aggression. Uh, we stand with the Ukrainian people and our support will continue as long as it takes to the restore their sovereignty. So uh, they're going to uh, sanction individuals uh, who were behind the sham votes, according to the government. Uh, but we also have sanctioning potentially taking place of people that were there as independent observers. Uh, and this began uh, yesterday with this website. Uh, foreign journalists with ties uh, to RT were among the international observers at the sham referendum. So from Ukraine, we've got the same language being used, this term sham referendum. So this is clearly a rapid response mechanism at work, uh, a common narrative right across uh, the, the, the uh, regimes. Now let's put uh, that back on screen for a second and have a look at who's in this on this list. Um, so uh, we can see that there are people represented from Belarus, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Brazil, uh, Venezuela on the first page, but also the United Kingdom is on the first uh, section of this list. And uh, well, only one name on that, uh, and that is Vanessa Bailey. Uh, and although the bio isn't quite correct, 
Uh, nonetheless, you are on that list. We'll come on to get some comment from you in a second on this. But as we move on down through the list, we've got more names from Egypt, from Zimbabwe, Italy, Cameroon, Latvia, Mozambique, uh, the, ne the Netherlands, uh, Germany, South Africa, Slovakia, USA, Togo, Uruguay, France, uh, Czech Republic. So uh, a wide range of countries, Vanessa, uh, but uh, you clearly are on that list. Uh, nobody else from the UK. <laughs> Yeah, I, kind of, I guess I stand out like a sore thumb <laughs> on that. Um, just quickly again also, you know, another point that's being made by these Western um, regimes is that it's, it's Russian occupied territory. I didn't actually, the only Russian soldiers I saw were at the border. The rest of the soldiers that you're being shown are of course the LPR and the DPR um, defense forces. I mean, everyone I asked, are you being forced to vote? They just laughed. They said, they're our families, they're our defense forces. Right, so just to make that point very clearly also. Um, this, this issue of um, targeting, as I said, more than 130 observers from, I mean, literally all over the world, has to backfire on them because many of these observers have, um, let's say, sort of, they're, they're not um, fly-by-nights. They're people that have professionally been observing referenda and, and elections throughout their careers. Many are politicians, many are company directors. And by the way, Germany, as far as I know, um, they sacked the guy that came um, to uh, witness the referenda when he returned to Germany. So the uh, repercussions for these people is already starting. There was one lady um, from India, the Hindu Times yesterday sort of uh, published a smear piece on her. Um, I mean, it's, it, the reaction is extraordinary. Yes, okay, well, let's, uh, let's bring this on screen then because uh, also... <laughs> Uh, from Wednesday then, but it came to light yesterday morning, a letter uh, from uh, Natalie Luzo, uh, Luzo, uh, Luzo, yes, uh, who is an MEP, but also, a, well, we'll come on to what she is in a second. Uh, but this is a, a letter personally to the uh, High Representative for the European Union for Foreign Affairs, uh, Mr. Burrell. Uh, while Vladimir Putin has organized sham referendums, again, the same language, clearly rapid response mechanism, common narrative here, uh, in the occupied and war-torn regions of Ukraine under impossible circumstances, some international citizens have volunteered to observe these referendums and act as guarantors for the Russian regime. Uh, we as elected members of the European Parliament demand that all those voluntarily assisted in any way with the, uh, uh, sorry, in the organization of these illegal referendums are individually targeted and sanctions among these people we would like to highlight the case of Vanessa Bailey, a British blogger uh, who's been continuously spreading fake news about Syria and acting as a mouthpiece for Vladimir Putin and Bashar al-Assad for years. Uh, we call for her to be included in the list of those sanctioned for her participation uh, as an international observer in these illegal referendums. We believe uh, it is time that Vladimir Putin's supporters were held accountable for their actions. Uh, so that was what she wrote. Uh, let's just uh, have a look and see who she is. Uh, very briefly, uh, uh, she is a French politician, a diplomat, academic administrator who served as a member of the European Parliament since 2019. Previously, she was director of the École Nationale d'Administration. Uh, and from 2012 to 2017, as the French Minister for European Affairs. Uh, uh, that was uh, from 2017 to 2019. Um, so, uh, Vanessa, uh, quite a senior politician in France, a member of Macron's party, a personal friend of Emmanuel Macron and very much a supporter of Emmanuel Macron has decided to single you out in particular? Well, also, I mean, she's the interesting thing. I think it was last year I wrote um, an article about her um, called something like who, who is uh, preventing the transparency of the OPCW because people might remember that she shouted down Mick Wallace in the European Parliament when he was raising questions um, about the, the sham OPCW report that of course led to the French, uh, UK and US uh, illegal aggression 
against Damascus and against the Syrian people in 2018. Now, she also has very close ties to the Syria campaign, uh, which of course has um, effectively provided PR uh, for the White Helmets since their establishment in 2013. So she's, she's very deeply rooted in the regime change network, let's say. And as you said, her language um, reflects her position within that network. I mean, she was largely responsible for providing the evidence of the Syrian government using chemical weapons in 2018. She, she was the very vocal um, supporter of French aggression. So, you know, she, if we're talking about shams, as I said, she has supported one of the biggest shams that led to war crimes against Syria. Um, and Vanessa, uh, so far, the only publication that's put this in writing uh, is The Grey Zone, uh, which that's, uh, so we want to highlight this article in particular. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, Max contacted me actually because the letter was leaked to me and then I think it was also leaked to uh, Grey Zone. <clears throat> I was uh, in the process of traveling back from Donbass to Moscow, so Max basically put out this article pretty quickly and he references the article that I wrote about her exposing her role uh, in the uh, Duma chemical weapon fraud. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I recommend that, that everyone reads it and shares it because I think, you know, what we're seeing now is, is the EU itself uh, descending into fascism. If, if, it, if it really allows this kind of uh, censorship, uh, as it states, we were volunteers. We had nothing to do with the organization of the referendum, which is what she is, is uh, inferring. Uh, we were there as independent observers of a referendum that had been organized not by Russia, but by the people of Donbass. Yes. Um, okay. And uh, well, if we could consider the, um, uh, the publication of that article that we showed a few seconds ago with your name on it as uh, almost a call for uh, action to be taken. I mean, in fact, you have already had death threats on Twitter as a result of that publication, but, yeah, uh, but and, you're now uh, on... Also Sorry, yeah, I'm just going to sorry. say you're you're now on the Mert Vrets uh, website as well. If we put that on screen, um, so yeah. they have uh, absolutely put you on the the kill list proper, as it were, because uh, this is effectively what yeah. this is. It seems actually that they're putting now all uh, the international observers on the kill list, and I would also like to mention that Adrian Bouquet, who was the uh, French journalist who exposed the Butcher uh, massacre as being a fraud and having been committed by the Azov battalion um, has been in the last two days uh, viciously attacked in Istanbul. He's a former French special forces, so he managed to defend himself uh, and uh, prevent uh, his assassination. Um, but he was seriously injured in a knife attack in Istanbul. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Patrick, have you got any comment? Yeah, yeah, I do actually. You know, the the case of the French uh, MEP Nathalie uh, Losau. I think uh, if Vanessa had been critical of her previously, and that had been public, she pub published an article criticizing her role in the OPCW Farago. Um, I think you could interpret what's happened as a case of this MEP uh, or is using her political position, her clout, to settle a personal political score. That's a uh, uh, blatant abuse of power. I think you can look at it in those terms. Why is she singled out Vanessa? Well, because of criticism that uh, she has received uh, from Vanessa. I think that's uh, something that people should look at. Is that fair game now? Is this, is this business as usual uh, in Brussels? Is this how things are done? Uh, we made the same sort of comment with uh, Graham Phillips, who was sanctioned by the British government and who really embarrassed the, the potential incoming at the time, uh, Prime Minister Liz Truss, because of course it was Liz Truss who called for the international brigades to open the floodgates of mercenaries to pile in to Ukraine to fight the good fight. And of course, Graham Phillips is interviewing 
uh, one of those types of people who happened to be British. Um, so was this a case of saving the hide of the future PM, uh, trying to divert or attack and deflect away from Truss's uh, huge uh, problem that she uh, contributed uh, with before the, uh, as the hostilities were underway. The other thing I want to point out as well is with this uh, sham referendum talking point, if you watch the UN General Assembly, Sergei Lavrov gave an incredible uh, speech and then held court for like over an hour and fielded random questions from the press, something you don't see any Western uh, foreign ministers ever uh, do. But anyway, he made an important distinction. Uh, it's the, the West is just writing this off categorically as a sham referendum, as they did with Crimea, insinuating that uh, people were sent to the polls at gunpoint to vote uh, yes on the referendum. There's two points with sovereign territory. One is the concept of, of sovereignty and sovereign territory. The other in the UN Charter is the concept of self-determination. You cannot talk about one and not the other, especially in the case of Donbass as an example. So they've held up for over eight years uh, against uh, a siege from what effectively was the uh, government in Kiev using the military against their own people in the most violent fashion, then built their own administration, uh, declared autonomy eventually, and now have a referendum to join the Russian Federation. So they've gone through all of the steps, uh, according to the UN Charter, uh, to, to achieve statehood or independence. So you cannot have this conversation without addressing both sides of that issue. And this is what Sergei Lavrov did when he delivered a pretty much a master class at the UN uh, General Assembly last week. So again, you won't have this conversation. You have to have this conversation. This is what diplomats are for. And where are the diplomats in the West? I have not seen anybody speak up, nor any Western journalists for that matter, uh, give a sober uh, analysis as to where this sits within the matrix of international law. They're not talking about that. And they refuse to, they'll avoid it at all costs because they wanna bolt hole this conversation into a very narrow uh, pipeline talking about sovereign territory, but omitting the entire context of events that led up to this moment in time. Yeah, okay, brilliant, thank you. Now, Vanessa, the question then is, are you particularly being singled out because you were there uh, or were you being singled out because you then took part in a press conference? No, I mean, I think Patrick set the nail on the head. I'm being singled out because this is personal. Uh, Loiseau has connections to the Syria campaign. I know that the Syria campaign has been trying for some time through Toby Cadman, Emma Winberg, to bring a case against me um, for uh, war crimes, basically. So, you know, this is a long running, including the BBC harassment campaign, of course. Um, this is a long-running campaign to, to target me, and I guess now they saw their opportunity and Loiseau saw a personal opportunity, as Patrick said, to abuse her power um, and to have her own back on me. Okay, well, look, we have a, we have a very short clip here of, uh, of you uh, speaking uh, at the press conference. Just have a quick listen to this. First of all, I, I want to reiterate uh, that the West will never approve of a referendum that does not comply with a Western agenda. So that's number one. Uh, the West's opinion should be made irrelevant by the decision of the people to reunify with Russia. And that is the very strong message I received from all of uh, the electoral committees that I spoke to and the people, particularly the refugees in Eastern Russia, in Ufa that I uh, visited, it's the opinion that they voiced. For them, this is their decision. They have lived under bombs, under uh, some of the most appalling atrocities committed against them for eight years, it is their decision to liberate themselves from an imposed Nazi regime that was imposed upon them in 2014 and has been committing crimes against them ever since and is controlled by the West. So the West has no say 
in this referendum other than to object to it because finally the people are liberating themselves and rejoining Russia. Uh, I have seen absolutely no violations. I have seen complete professionalism among the electoral committees. I've seen a high level of security, a huge amount of solidarity, compassion for people who are maybe struggling to get to uh, the polling stations. And for me, what is very important, there has been complete respect for people's privacy. And we should just uh, mention, Vanessa, the reason you were speaking quite slowly there is because of for the benefit of the interpreters. Yeah, I mean, there are people that don't realize when, when someone is interpreting, it is considerate to speak more slowly than normal so that they can uh, either write what you're saying or translate uh, simultaneously. Yes. OK, thanks. Now, Patrick, uh, let's come back to the issue of uh, uh, bombing of pipelines and so on. Uh, we showed on Wednesday the, uh, the clip uh, of Joe Biden talking about uh, uh, taking out uh, the Nord Stream pipelines from, I think that was February or so. Um, but things have moved on a little bit in the last couple of days. They have, they have. I just wanted to to update that situation. And uh, there there are some clues as to, uh, to, to kind of reiterate where uh, our suspicions are on this. Um, again, nobody's taking credit for it. Uh, so if this was a terrorist attack uh, of high value, certainly that... Uh, any self-respecting terrorist group would want to leap forward and take credit for this one, an absolutely historic attack, but yet nobody has come forward uh, as of yet. So Joseph Burrell saying this is a deliberate disruption of the EU energy infrastructure, and they will uh, move uh, with the harshest uh, terms uh, against whoever is responsible. So those are strong words from Brussels. If it's uh, ever proven that uh, maybe the US or one of their NATO allies or, or a combination thereof are responsible. Will they act against them in the harshest terms? I somehow doubt it. <laughs> but uh, so the reactions from the United States here, uh, Donald Trump on Truth Social uh, sort of made waves uh, a little bit anyway. There's not much coverage of this in the US media, but wow, uh, what a statement, World War III, anybody. He's, he's making, uh, he's alluding to uh, all the various uh, admissions or tacit admissions um, by uh, people like Sikorsky, uh, Joe Biden, Victoria Nuland, et cetera. So Donald Trump said this could lead to World War III. So Trump's coming out uh, alluding to the, the fact the U.S. might be responsible. He's sort of taking the Tucker Carlson uh, line on this. There's a few others uh, that are taking this position as well. So Donald Trump's right out in front of this, kind of pointing the finger of suspicion, really, at the Biden administration. You could call this electioneering call it what you like. So the question is, where, where's Joe Biden? You'd think the president would have come out and sort of either condemned this attack or uh, congratulated whoever did it. Um, obviously not. But Biden was asked this point blank, or he was uh, challenged at the press conference in the Pacific Island Hawaii press conference event. And he basically ducked the question, totally uh, avoided it. So again, he, he opted instead to talk about the sham uh, referendum and so forth. Um, so Biden totally ducked it. And then Lloyd Austin uh, took to the podium and he actually commented on this. So he's the only U.S. official to, of any weight to comment on this. this. Isn't This is what Lloyd Austin said at this point. I think there's a lot of speculation. Until we get further information or we're able to do further analysis, uh, we won't speculate on who may have been responsible. That's the defense secretary. Now, if this was a U.S. or U.S.-led operation, it would be classified um, to the highest level of classification for national security reasons, obviously. Uh, and if the U.S. wanted to keep it secret, um, they would, it would be on a need-to-know basis. So uh, clearly, Lloyd Austin, by basing on this comment, would have no knowledge of this uh, operation. So he's, the U.S. Defense Secretary is not on the need-to-know list if you believe uh, that the U.S. Uh, was behind it. I think that's quite plausible. Lloyd Austin is just regarded as a sort of uh, lower level uh, functionary uh, in the U.S. Hi power hierarchy. Uh, so, so what about the uh, former Polish uh, FM 
and uh, MEP uh, uh, Radek Sikorsky, the M Mr. Applebaum, as it were, uh, he's deleted his tweet, his infamous tweet, believe it or not. So isn't that interesting? He, this was out up for about 48 hours and maybe under pressure from the Biden administration or just the kind of embarrassment of it, or he's getting too much heat. Um, he's basically deleted this tweet. So that's quite amazing uh, from this uh, Polish dignitary um, who's a, a fervent anti-Russian hawk, uh, along with his wife. Of course, she's uh, infamous in that regard. So, back to Washington Post came out immediately and attacked in hours of his noted the uh, image that he used. It has him palling around with Donald Trump. The U.S. has tried to in this as a Trump talking point that the U.S. or somebody other than Russia might be responsible for it. It's literally this issue is cut right down partisan lines, if you can believe that. Nobody is interested uh, in the nuance of it, in the facts. No one really wants to know anymore. Uh, it, it seems like this has just become a partisan thing. Here's what they're saying. This is the argument made by the Washington Post. There are many reasons to be skeptical of the notion of the United States conducting sabotage. High on that list is the is such an action would strain relations with European allies who would like to have access to that pipeline at some future date. Like that would stop the United States or anybody from engaging in a dastardly act such as this. Nonetheless, you know, even currently foregoing Russian energy uh, in solidarity with Ukraine. So the, it's kind of a not very plausible, disingenuous analysis here um, by the Washington Post. And I might add that there's absolutely pretty much zero coverage, and I'll tell you why uh, shortly, um, why this has been buried uh, in the United States at this particular time. But let's go back and look at the clues uh, before this happened. There, there was a, a talking point with, you probably are aware of the Der Spiegel uh, admission that the CIA had warned weeks previously or back in August, in fact, uh, that there, uh, the, the Nord Stream pipelines could be targeted. So in the German press, uh, here is uh, Tax Spiegel, and they're saying, that, this is translating, by the way, uh, Berlin is uh, considering the possibility Ukraine or Ukrainian affiliated forces uh, are being behind the attack but also floating the idea of a false flag by Russia to supposedly make Ukraine look bad, drive energy prices higher and so forth. Not very credible, not very plausible. Nonetheless, let's write this off as propaganda, but let's re revisit the uh, Der Spiegel uh, admission as well. So this is again, German press, very close to the source of this incident. CIA warned German government against attack on Baltic pipelines. So people would look at this and think, well, that's interesting that the CIA had prior knowledge. More likely, this is this is CIA misdirection planted in what many would regard as, as one of the sort of vehicles of uh, U.S. intelligence propaganda, which is Der Spiegel itself, but pretty much every other mainstream German media outlet pretty much works on that basis. So this is, I think, CIA misdirection. This is, was put out to create confusion because in the immediate aftermath, of this incident, they're blame, They're saying, well, it could be a Ukrainian special ops team or Ukrainian affiliated group, like whatever that means, I'd have no idea. But uh, they said oh, they could have done the deed underwater. So kind of everyone agrees this had to have been a state actor uh, in terms of what the resources you need uh, to conduct th this type of operation. So this is all a uh, very uh, well organized and planted misdirection and propaganda in the European press. So that does lead us to uh, Maria Zakharova. Um, she's basically called out what you uh, talked about on Wednesday's uh, program as well, uh, that NATO was conducting exercises using deep sea equipment in the area of Nord Stream 1 and 2. Um, and so she basically pointed this out. RT has uh, got this on their website, of course. Um, of, this will be written off as Russian disinformation just because it appears on RT. I thought I'd just throw that caveat in any way, because it's obligatory caveat as well. But uh, yeah, so she's talking about the Baltops drill that you guys covered on Wednesday. And that seems like a very likely and plausible uh, scenario here. But let's just uh, turn the clock back just slightly. And a lot of people may or may not have noticed that uh, September 22nd, around that time, Germany moved to nationalize the Russian Gazprom uh, subsidiary uh, in Germany. 
So uh, Gazprom, uh, Deutsch, uh, Deutschland, their their operation, they took it over, uh, and so and so basically, they s said that they're secretly uh, creating a holding to nationalize Ger the, the Gazprom's Berlin-based unit. And the takeover is deemed by Berlin as a means to secure national gas supplies. That does not imply any compensation payments from the federal government for for, for its Russian owners. That's a forced takeover of the Russian Gazprom infrastructure and operations in Germany. That went quietly under the radar back in September uh, 22nd. And a lot, a lot of people didn't pick up on that. So we're just pointing to that because there were some interesting moves uh, before this incident has happened. Uh, and again, at the, around the same time, around September 24th, uh, the head of Saxony, uh, Michael uh, Kretschmer, he said, we are already witnessing that we can't do without Russian gas. He added that uh, the sanctions imposed by Berlin over Russia's offensive against Ukraine have contributed to the shortage and situation. So n not a lightweight political figure within Germany, however, uh, uh, seems to be at this moment a voice in the wilderness uh, buried under the whole Nord Stream story. So uh, whether these things are going to be looked at um, or considered in the wider analysis. Uh, I probably doubt it at this point, but I think it's worth pointing out that uh, com coming into the winter, there was definitely pressure put on different parts of the German establishment to ease sanctions and to get Nord Stream restarted. Nord Stream 2, in fact, uh, restarted as well, albeit on a limited basis in terms of the percentage of Russian gas that they would take from that pipeline. But that's basically what was going on uh, in the run-up to this. Now, I want to point out, this isn't the only pipeline now that's in jeopardy. The South Stream uh, pipeline, the Turk Stream pipeline, which Russia has uh, running under the Black Sea via Turkey into Bulgaria and Eastern Europe, um, this has been suspended right now. And this is, well, this is according to Radio Free Europe. Uh, so the claim is that the Netherlands have revoked the license of the Turkstream operator. This is a Dutch-based or listed company. Um, so this is international uh, concern, obviously, with maritime rules and things like that. This A lot of international agreements have gone into laying down this pipeline system, uh, the Turkstream and Southstream systems that go into Europe. So, and again, the suspension of all contracts related to technical support of the gas pipeline, including design, manufacture, assembly, testing, repair, and maintenance, and training are all canceled as of yesterday. So, the, uh, albeit a pro this is a propaganda, a state-run propaganda outlet uh, for Washington Radio for Europe, but these are the claims uh, that they're making. So, we'll take it on face value for the moment and wait for uh, further confirmation on the status of this, but that's being reported. I might add that those pipelines are very much going to be t regarded as a military target going forward. Okay, so think about all of the different undersea pipelines and also overground pipelines. I think this is a very dangerous area that we're kind of wading into here. If everyone's going to turn a blind eye to what happened with the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipeline, certainly the President of the United States, the British leadership, NATO leaders are pretty much turning a blind eye to what happened. Is that a tacit admission of guilt or indifference? But if it's indifference, you're basically opening the door for more of these same type of incidents, attacks in other pipelines, especially ones relating or coming from Russia. So, and again, uh, the, the timing of this is a coincidence or not, but the day of the Nord Stream incident, I, you, you may have reported on this previously, I'm not sure, but uh, a new pipeline was announced and launched that same day from between Norway and Poland, sending natural gas to Poland, which would make Poland a major energy hub now for Europe. Is that a coincidence? And it actually crisscrosses with the Nord Stream. It crisscrosses the Nord Stream pathway and very close to, in fact, where uh, the explosions have allegedly taken place. So is that a coincidence? Uh, you be the judge. I don't have a map on screen, but uh, you can go look up uh, in this particular article or any of these articles on this new pipeline by Euronews. Uh, it does crisscross the Nord Stream route very close to Donholm Island, the uh, the Danish island territory. 
in fact, right exactly next to it. Um, so that's just another uh, thing to look at and maybe ask some serious questions about that. That operation uh, could have been carried out uh, clandestine in a clandestine way at that time. So it, it, is this a cons another conspiracy theory? Uh, you can be the judge. I don't know, Mike, did you cover the, the Poland-Norway uh, no, pipeline? No, we didn't. Because those are, two, no. those are two countries that would be beneficiaries. Uh, Norway is very active in NATO with NATO drills, joint drills in recent years. So they've been more hawkish on Russia. So they're a, an absolute competitor and beneficiary. So Poland and Norway would be in the frame. I don't know, Mike, what your opinion is, but I think if the, U the U.S. would avoid doing it directly so that in the future, if it ever did come out, they would have some level of deniability, but they would provide support for such an operation, logistical support, cover, and so forth. But it would also be in the U.S. interest not to actually do the sabotage directly um, in order to keep their hands clean, so to speak. But I don't know what your opinion on this is. Well, I mean, it's it's not it's not massively deep water, but I'm not really clear who else, you know, other than a a, a state actor that could have uh, pulled off a gag like that. Yeah, it, w it wouldn't even take uh, large submarines. It could be done with very small uh, um, remote control or unmanned uh, uh, aqua vehicles or so, uh, some things like that. Yeah. So there's a lot of different possibilities and shape charges and limpet mines. Not difficult to carry out or even place well in advance and then wait for the opportune moment in order to detonate them. So that's also a uh, very much a possibility as well. Russia is, is launched a sub, I believe, to, um, they're, they're wanting to go inspect the damage uh, and to find out more about it to see if they can get some evidence, in fact, as to what type of explosion there was or what was used, what sort of materials were used in order to uh, create the damage. So that's, that's also underway as well. No doubt the international community is going to ignore any findings that are presented by Russia oh, and will sure. be written off as just the mad ravings of Vladimir Putin. But here's the big takeaway, and you don't have to go much further than Associated Press. They're using this event to basically throw doubt on natural gas as a source of energy. The methane leak now, as a result of the sabotage, is evidence, uh, according to climate scientists, that we need to move away from natural gas full stop. If you can believe that, they're taking advantage of this. Climate scientists have found that methane emissions from oil and gas industry are far more worse than what the companies are reporting, despite claims by firms that they're reducing them. So that's where it's going in terms of the talking points. So it's immediately, immediately shifting into the green talking points. So there are advanced uh, the, the green agenda, the green the moving off of quote, fossil fuels and really what is what is by many as the, de, the the process of deindustrialization of, of Europe and there's a great article here uh, by French journalist Freddie Ponton uh, and it's it's called Chaos by Design: The Roots of EU Energy Crisis and France's Green Deception and uh, he quotes Emmanuel Macron here: uh, "End of the world." or end of the month, we are going to deal with both, and we must deal with both. So he's using sort of biblical uh, biblical rhetoric, Macron. But this article is great because it tracks back to the Project 1980s, which was a child of the Council on Foreign Relations, and Paul Volcker, and the Trilateral Commission. And this was basically, it seems like, the exact blueprint for the Great Reset. So before the Great Reset came from the uh, World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab is getting credit for this. The actual nuts and bolts and the sort of logistics of this was laid out in the 1980s by and 70s by the trilateralists, led by the time of former Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker and other Cyrus Vance and other uh, operatives here that were top trilateralists. So you see the policy being formed in the CFR, put out in public via their publications, and then the trilateralists which are implement, uh, um, embedded in key government agencies and appointed positions, they then carry out the policy. They implement the policy. So wherever you see members of the Trilateral Commission, uh, their job, according to this research article by the French journalist Freddy Ponton, is their job is to implement these policies that are right. moving towards an end goal, which is the disintegration of the Western 
economy, as it were. And the evidence in here is quite stunning. Um, and that would include the leader of the current leader of the Labour Party, by the way. But uh, let's. Uh, That's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, let, let's just uh, let's quickly move on because, uh, you know, never uh, to miss an opportunity, uh, the British government needs to keep the pressure on. So here's Fergus Eckersley uh, speaking at the United Nations yesterday, uh, talking about Syria. And Syria is refusing to make any progress on its obligations under the Chemical Weapons Convention and under Resolution 2118. Uh, he said, this is a crystal clear reminder of Assad's disregard of international norms and of the threat to his regime, sorry, the threat his regime poses. Uh, this is not a dormant issue. This is an active refusal to implement the council's resolutions. Uh, and finally, uh, we also all know that Syria's failings are only part of the story. The actions of Russia in continuing to protect the Assad regime in its use and, and stockpile of chemical weapons show that they have no genuine interest in implementing the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, or protecting international security. Uh, very quickly, Vanessa, um, I mean, I don't know what you can say to that. Oh, not a lot, really. I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, what can I say? It's just part of the universal sham. Yeah. I mean, it is, you know, it continues. No, there, there, there really isn't. I think most people can figure out the, the absolute hypocrisy that is oozing from all of these statements. Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, if you like what uh, the UK column does, you would like to support us, then please head over to community.ukcolumn.org. Uh, there are options for you to help us out there. Uh, or you can pick something up at the UK, UK column shop, which is shop.ukcolumn.org. But please do share uh, any of the material you find on the various platforms. And Patrick, uh, a further reminder uh, about the uh, Assad uh, protest. Assange. Uh, sorry, Assange. I do apologize. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah no, this, well, not quite Freudian, just, yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, October 8th, um, they're, they're attempting to do something hugely ambitious, which was to create a human chain around Parliament, including going across the Thames and uh, across the Lambeth South Bank. And it's going to require uh, just over 5,000 people. There's a lot of coordinating and organizing that goes into putting this together, as you can imagine. And they're calling on people. This is Stella uh, Assange, uh, his his wife, and also the uh, Don't Extradite Assange campaign and their WikiLeaks team. They're calling for people to come out, show their support. This has never been done before, this type of human chain. And I'm going to add that uh, right now, the, the, the sort of physical condition of Julian Assange in Bel Belmarsh prison is very dire. Um, he, he's, he's suffering uh, badly on many different levels. So, you know, we're, we're at a really dangerous situation here uh, going forward. This is, his health is not in the best and mental health as well. Um, he's basically being held in arbitrary detention now uh, for pretty much was in the Ecuadorian embassy or under house arrest and then in the Ecuadorian embassy and then now in a maximum security prison. So the, the, someone's life is, is definitely on the line here. Not only Julius is on the line, but the free, the free press, the future of the free press is, is also uh, in jeopardy as well. So by yeah. coming out and supporting, if people are watching the UK column and they believe in free speech, free press, and they want to see Julian Assange uh, reunited with his family and end this political persecution, it's a completely political uh, persecution and prosecution and collusion between Britain and the United States, whereby Britain is even recognizing its own extradition treaty. Uh, which bars extraditing political prisoners. This is 100% a political case. If you believe this is an important case for the future, then we encourage you to get involved and to go out and show your support on October 8th. There's information here. You just go to the URL, which we put on screen. Uh, you can screenshot that. But it's um, there's, there's many causes worth getting behind. And uh, I think this is one of them. And I hope uh, other people agree. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, okay, now let uh, yesterday then uh, in the European uh, European Parliament, sorry, uh, this event was held. Uh, Russian disinformation and propaganda regarding Ukraine in the light of its war of aggression and its impact on democratic processes in the European Union. This was a public hearing, um, and uh, well, I wonder who was involved in it. Well, here's uh, opening remarks, and uh, well, Natalie Loiseau was uh, speaking. 
Um, also, by the way, you will just mention in passing, but we're going to focus on Natalie's comments in a second, but uh, Michael Sheldon from Bellingcat, perhaps unsurprisingly involved in that as well. Um, so anyway, we've got a couple of little uh, clips from this. Um, let's listen to the first one. Um, and uh, yeah, let's just listen to this and then we can comment on it afterwards. Once more, uh, in G2 and CEDE have decided to have this hearing jointly, as indeed this information is fully part of Russia's war efforts. Actually, the issue isn't new and Russia started to target Ukraine uh, using inter alia propaganda and disinformation since 2014. We hardly paid attention then, except when the crash of MH17 flight took place and triggered countless Russian efforts to try to deny responsibility. So Russian propaganda is what we've been seeing since 2014. Uh, OK, in the next clip, she's talking about how do we counter this Russian disinformation? And there's one particular point in this, which I think is of concern to everybody. So listen to this. Malicious misinformation campaigns originating from Russia towards Ukraine are not a new topic either, as they have been continuously going on for years. What is unprecedented, though, is the breadth and depth of covert propaganda campaigns designed at deterring European public opinions to support Ukraine and to accept the increase in sanctions towards Russia. We just learned about the doppelganger influence operation, which was debunked both by EU Disinfo Lab and by Meta. From May 2022, Russia used clones of authentic European media, such as The Guardian, 20 Minutes, Build or Ansa, to try to discredit Ukraine and spread a false narrative about the consequences of the sanctions on European citizens. Good news is that it was debunked. Bad news is that it was possible and that the culprits were not clearly identified. We probably have to better regulate the domain name industry and foster cooperation between state institutions, platforms, researchers and NGOs so that they can really join forces, prevent, expose and counter such operations. So her claim there is that some people set up clone uh, websites which look like The Guardian and other media outlets and use that to push out disinformation. Uh, and therefore, what they've got to do is to set up uh, tighter uh, partnerships with tech companies and others. Uh, and particularly, and this is the bit that uh, we all knew was coming, uh, but this is the first sort of public demands for it that I've heard, is to take control of the domain name system uh, in order to make sure that certain uh, websites can be easily, well, effectively domain names seized by uh, through government mandate and uh, websites taken offline. Uh, but she did one make, make one interesting observation in this final short clip here. I would also like to underline the consequences of Russian disinformation efforts outside Europe. Every single mission of our parliament in Africa, the Middle East or Latin America is an occasion to witness the efficiency of Russian propaganda and to deplore the weakness of our strategic communication. So I just uh, thought that was quite an amusing uh, place to end. So she's decrying the, the efficiency of Russian propaganda and how, well, of course, the Europeans and the US and the UK, we don't use propaganda. We use strategic communications, uh, but ours is nowhere near as good. Uh, so, uh, Vanessa, I'll come to you first. What are your thoughts on, uh, on her performance there? <clears throat> Well, it's interesting. She mentions, of course, the EU Disinfo Lab. I mentioned her connections to Syria campaign. The EU Disinfo Lab, allegedly, according to Emma Winberg, Emma Winberg, of course, uh, became Emma Le Measure, the wife of James Le Measure, and uh, became strategy director at Mayday Rescue. Um, Emma has now joined the board of EU Disinfo. In fact, I'm going to be um, working on a section on that for next week. So, you know, the, the, these tentacles are growing more and more um, connected and interlinked, as we know they are, and effectively what they're doing is creating the iron dome for truth, right? You know, they're, they're trying to basically 
prevent any truth entering discourse um, in the West. It's, it's, it's extraordinary times that we're living through right now. Yes. Uh, Patrick, any thoughts? Uh, yeah. Uh, w when you have collusion between uh, any state bodies or even uh, bodies that are being funded by the state indirectly, like Bellingcat, for instance, like Disinfo Labs uh, with the EU or the U.S. government, in this case, these companies like Meta and social media companies, they can't claim the sort of we're a private company argument. That goes right out the window because if the government is colluding on any level or sending blacklists, which has been proven in the United States through discovery in a recent federal case that's been taken out by uh, members of the Great Barrington Declaration uh, who accuse uh, Twitter and the Biden administration of basically sharing information of what posts to and what it goes down, then all of a sudden that private company uh, defense that uh, Facebook and Twitter and others have been behind, um, it pretty much is null and void at that point. Then the government is directly involved with them as a partner to deny citizens of their First Amendment right in the United States, that's freedom of speech, then that is a violation. So the government can then fall under uh, sanction or lawsuit uh, for their actions, as can uh, Facebook as well. Now, this has been thrown out uh, or just dim dismissed by uh, a judge uh, recently, but they're going to appeal. So there's still going to be more to come on this issue. Now, what we what we saw here is just the European version of that. And I think it's kind of rich. I'll just make a, a comment. It's kind of rich that they have someone from Bellingcat on their panel. This is an organization that regularly puts out uh, absolute tripe and even, even involved in uh, a scandal recently where they're handing out bags of cash through an intermediary uh, to sort of get uh, Russian pilots to defect uh, and so forth and uh, using uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian uh, agents as well uh, as part of this kind of uh, trying to get intelligence and so forth. And this has been denied by Bell and Cat. They said, oh, we're making a documentary film and this was all uh, nothing to see here. It was just a documentary film. Plus, they've been proven and debunked themselves multiple times. Meanwhile, they're actually getting funding from government agencies, NATO member states like the U.S. or uh, the U.K., for instance. So it's the whole thing is, is, is ridiculous on its face. So this is just part of the, the wider ridiculous effort of fighting disinformation when the biggest source of disinformation right now on this planet are government and the mainstream media. And that's, that's beyond debate at this point. Uh, well, indeed it is. Um, okay, uh, let, let's just put uh, Vanessa's website. And Vanessa mentioned this uh, this article here uh, on Natalie uh, Loazzo uh, earlier on in the program. We'll just mention it here. Uh, so the headline is Protecting the OPCW Against Transparency. Who is Natalie Loazzo? Loazzo. So uh, go and read that if you haven't read it so far. Now, uh, we were reporting uh, some time ago, a couple of weeks ago, uh, that PayPal had... Uh, uh, kicked Toby Young, uh, plus uh, two of his uh, organizations, off the platform. Uh, but Patrick, uh, following some pressure from MPs, apparently, uh, they have, in fact, uh, changed their decision. Not just pressure from MPs, but a barrage, a barrage of messages and communications from custom customers of PayPal and members of the public here. And Toby Young just makes one comment that I'll highlight here. Uh, which is that, uh, well, here, here's the comment from PayPal or the statement that they've made uh, on this directly here. And they're saying, uh, we have confirmed to review the information provided in connection with your account. And we take seriously the input from our customers and stakeholders. Uh, but based on these ongoing reviews, we have made the decision to reinstate your account, all three accounts, his personal account, the uh, Free Speech Society account, and the Daily Skeptic account. You should now be able to use your accounts uh, in a normal way. We sincerely appreciate your business <laughs> uh, and offer our apologies uh, of any inconveniences or disruptions. Very sorry, uh, forgive us. And Toby Young just uh, puts one line here uh, and he says, forgive me if I don't jump for joy. And he just goes on to explain the absolute hell that he's been through uh, with regarding organizing the finances and the budgets and the overheads of these uh, operations. And the Daily Skeptic is a sizable operation um, that's been completely uh, torpedoed by a PayPal. Uh, why? And the, the question is, where did the pressure come from? 
will we ever know? And again, what I just said previously about Facebook and Twitter and these people colluding with the U.S. government, is this pressure coming directly from government or is it coming from the media? Because we've seen the Huffington Post harassing or these hope not hate type groups, um, these sort of pseudo uh, advocacy groups uh, putting pressure on corporations. The press are very effective too. We're going to run a story. Are you supporting these extremists? Why are you doing this? And then the the the, the management of PayPal, whatever, would sort of panic at that point. Uh, do they get a call or a letter or they have a meeting with government ministers on this? This is where we're at right now. And it would be nice to have answers to this question because this would affect many, many other people going forward. Will we get answers to that particular question? How did PayPal come to this decision? Who provided them with the tip uh, to take down all of Toby Young's accounts? Because I really doubt that it's coming from their customer service a boiler room in Bangalore, India, or wherever it is. Uh, indeed. Now we have a little bit of video uh, from the UN General Assembly. Do you want, just want to introduce this? Well, uh, on the back of this conversation about censorship and Toby Young, here is uh, the one, the only Jacinda Ardern uh, holding court here at the UN General Assembly. And I apologize if this is not the creepiest uh, little speech that you'll probably see this week. But listen very closely and take notes to what she's saying, because there's so much to unpack here. But go ahead. This week, we launched an initiative alongside companies and nonprofits to help improve research and understanding of how a person's online experiences are curated by automated processes. This will also be important in understanding more about mis- and disinformation online, a challenge that we must, as leaders, address. Sadly, I think it's easy to dismiss this problem as one in the margins. I can certainly understand the desire to leave it to someone else. As leaders, we're rightly concerned that even the most light touch approaches to disinformation could be misinterpreted as being hostile to the values of free speech that we value so highly. But while I cannot tell you today what the answer is to this challenge, I can say with complete certainty that we cannot ignore it. To do so poses an equal threat to the norms we all value. After all, how do you successfully end a war if people are led to believe the reason for its existence is not only legal but noble? How do you tackle climate change if people do not believe it exists? How do you ensure the human rights of others are upheld when they are subjected to hateful and dangerous rhetoric and ideology? The weapons may be different, but the goals of those who perpetuate them is often the same, to cause chaos and reduce the ability of others to defend themselves, to disband communities, to collapse the collective strength of countries who work together. But we have an opportunity here to ensure that these particular weapons of war do not become an established part of warfare. In these times, I'm acutely aware of how easy it is to feel disheartened. We are facing many battles on many fronts, but there is cause for optimism because for every new weapon we face, there is a new tool to overcome it. For every attempt to push the world into chaos is a collective conviction to bring us back to order. We have the means, we just need the collective will. Oh, God. Yeah, did she go to the same school as uh, Liz Truss, Patrick? Wow. You know, yeah, well, she's an understudy of Tony Blair. Let's just point that out. She worked uh, with Tony Blair during his rise to power. Um, it, do you notice the Indian delegation during, during that was just staring at her with a blank stare? Like, what is she on about? New Zealand's, what, three million people? Uh, and so she's trying to dictate global policy on censorship from the UN pulpit. And using the injured voice, you notice how she employs sort of Obama style gushing uh, dramatics with the injured voice. And but she's calling information a weapon of war. So basically bracketing analysis and opinion that goes against the official narrative. She's, she made allu alluded to the Ukrainian situation that we can't end this horrible war of all this disinformation is circulating uh, and climate change. She threw that in there and so forth. The so weapons of war information, opinion, news, analysis, it's not coming from the source that she 
or, or her uh, globalist uh, cadre approve of, then that's a weapon of war, says uh, Jacinda Ardern. So, I mean, wh where can you start? I don't know, Mike, did you pick up anything in there that was particularly uh, offensive? <laughs> Well, uh, yeah. Well, uh, she's very much on the on the narrative for sure with respect to mis uh, disinformation and misinformation. But look, Patrick, I just wanted to to uh, put this on screen because uh, you're you're about to talk about uh, Hurricane Ian in a second. But if we're talking about misinformation and disinformation and that coming from the mainstream press, here's just one example of it. We could. This is just from today. So so this is a mail today. Tale of Hurricane. Ian did lash Britain, nation braces for a battering when tempest that wreaked havoc in US brings 94 mile per hour gales and two day deluge from today. So the mail is claiming that Hurricane Ian, which is currently sitting uh, off the west coast of the sorry, off the east coast of uh, or the southeast coast of South Carolina, uh, is going to somehow in the next five minutes whip across the Atlantic Ocean and, uh, and, and attack uh, the west coast of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Uh, today, and this is the standard of journalism that we have at the moment, uh, Patrick, where where they just simply publish lies, and it's just incredible that that uh, I mean, the, the, okay, the comments on the mail article were taking them to task for this because everybody was was understanding the reality of the situation, but the fact that there is no editorial control, no real standard of editorial control uh, these days, uh, and when people believe that that a hurricane is going to fly across the Atlantic and attack us in, in five minutes, then they're equally likely to believe the kind of narratives that they're getting out of the governments of the world uh, on Ukraine and other issues. My, 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 I'm disappointed, Mike, that the mail uh, forgot to mention the fact that when it does jump, uh, from, from Georgia up to, to Cornwall, it's going to be carrying a cloud of Omicron, uh, by doing that as well, the aerosol, the droplets. Uh, in the hurricane, and it drops uh, the, a whole new COVID variant deluge uh, onto Devon and Cornwall. So the fact that the Daily Mail omitted that, I'm hugely disappointed with their editorial team on that. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, let's uh, let's come on to uh, onto this then. Uh, the perfect media storm. Here's the image that we all should be focusing on here. This is the methane bubbling up in the Baltic Sea in the United States. That would be the big story. It should be anyway. Uh, but this was the perfect media storm because guess what has paved over this potential World War III pretext event is Hurricane Ian. So this is just wall-to-wall -wall coverage. The, the Nord Stream story is a non-event in the United States. A, a, a few mentions at the beginning of that. Uh, very uh, dangerous and uh, crucial and consequential event in the Baltic Sea. You'll never hear it spoken of. It's just going to get washed uh, under the wake of Hurricane uh, Ian. And that's not to, d to dim diminish the suffering and the damage going on. It's unbelievable. There's billions and billions of dollars of damage. This would be the equivalent of a major war zone. Uh, whole towns are wiped out, um, whole areas, uh, docks, segways between islands and the mainland have been taken out, Sanibel Island, down by Tampa, this one example, literally gone. So all this sort of road traffic um, is, is, is gone basically for the, for the time being. And there's a massive amount of air rescue operations to get people out. They've got sewage water problems and all sorts of other things. The, the sea has receded in many areas, uh, but it's, it's, this is probably the, one of the worst storms ever on record. Um, not the strongest, but the fact that it hit landfall and went right up the center of the state and now is uh, is hitting slightly weaker, but still strong in Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina in the next 48 hours. But uh, I think we have a, we have a clip from uh, Ron DeSantis here. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, Charlotte County. He's giving an update just last night uh, on the status of all this, but we can roll that. Uh, in all told search and rescue operations, it started in the wee hours of the morning. As soon as the winds died down enough to where it was safe, uh, you had Coast Guard assets, you had urban search and rescue teams. We've had the National Guard out assisting people. Uh, there have been more than 700 confirmed rescues, and there's likely uh, many more than that uh, that will be confirmed as more data comes in. Uh, people have been rescued from places like Fort Myers, Fort Myers Beach, Sanibel, uh, Marco Island, as well as the Barrier Islands in Charlotte County. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of 
um, calls coming in as the storm was really raging yesterday. Uh, people uh, who did not evacuate were hunkered down. There was storm surge. There was a lot of, of, um, uh, of apprehension, understandably. When initially the first responders came this morning, people would wave them down, uh, whether they were by helicopter, boat, or high water vehicle. Now what they're finding is on places like Sanibel, most of the residents are just waving thank you for coming, but they say that they're fine uh, and that they're staying put. Now, I think that there's going to be issues with being on some of those islands uh, because they're not going to have services like we expect uh, for quite some time, given the limitations of transportation. Uh, but nevertheless, that, that's a sign that, that some of the folks who did ride it out uh, are stabilized uh, in their home. So you can get an idea that the total devastation, it's, it's, yeah, some people say that's a one a year, uh, so that, that's, uh, um, police and, and in terms of the death, all not talking was number they would need uh, to, before they announce any of that. So you might hear some announcements along those lines, um, in the days, hopefully those numbers are not very high. Um, but you can see that's kind of Ron DeSantis's one of his dress rehearsals potentially for uh, presidential nomination in 2024, sad and uh, serious event. But he's also getting attacked um, by the Democrat uh, camps uh, on this. So they've used this storm as a chance to sort of attack DeSantis as being a kind of pro-Trumper, a climate denier, uh, and say, well, you know, there's even some people kind of making the, the thing like, well, you need federal funding now, don't you? Uh, you're, but you're against the federal government. Uh, they're talking about Florida, which has marketed itself as the free state of Florida because DeSantis is basically saying no more COVID restrictions, no more lockdowns, no mask mandates, no vaccine mandates. So, and so they're using this opportunity to take the shot and it's not going over well, bad optics for Democrats that are doing that. Here's one really a good example. This is The View. This is um, a, a US talk show. Uh, I think some people know what this is. Th this show's about. It's Whoopi Goldberg and, and cast and crew, and they sit around talking. But l listen to this comment on Hurricane Ian and DeSantis here, and they'll give you an idea uh, that the climate change uh, argument is just completely out of control on this storm. But go ahead and roll this quote from Governor DeSantis about climate change, quote, I am not in the pews of the church of the global warming leftists. This is what he thinks about climate change. And now his state is getting hit with one of the worst hurricanes well, that perhaps, they will ever see. Perhaps. So, uh, so. What she, what's she saying there? Is she saying that, he, that, that Florida only got hit by this, uh, this uh, storm because of DeSantis' position on climate change? Yeah, and Republicans more broadly, their denial of, of climate change is one of the reasons why this storm was particularly harsh, uh, if you can believe that. And they need to basically, we need more spending on climate change. So there's people campaigning in the run-up to the midterms using Hurricane Ian as the rallying cry to do more to fight climate change. And if you ask anybody, what's the connection between uh, uh, climate policy and this storm? Can you show any scientific link? Uh, if we spend more, if we spend a few trillion more, is it going to dampen the power of these hurricanes? I mean, this is just total uh, insanity. But in, in a way, it's good, Mike, that people are kind of showing themselves to be completely hysterical right now because it kind of shows the, all, all the sort of demagoguery that goes along with the whole climate change uh, conversation. But I'm sure, you know, you got the same, didn't you, with the heat wave uh, in the UK recently, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, well, let's uh, let's move on then just to our final uh, story and back to the UK and the latest all-cause mortality statistics. Uh, and once again, uh, we've got another week of excess mortality with very little impact uh, from deaths that are supposedly uh, linked to uh, coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, and still basically nothing in the media asking uh, why this outrageous number of uh, excess or the, this outrageous amount of excess mortality is happening. Um, but in the meantime, we are getting tweets uh, from this from all kinds of people, uh, and in this case, Eric uh, uh, Falding, uh, who is uh, a, a, an uh, immunologist. Uh, UK is entering its fourth wave of COVID-19 uh, in one year. 
uh, led by conservative leaders who don't give a damn about even hospital admissions, vaccinating kids, school safety, all the while NHS staff burn out and quit. Uh, I worry how bad this fall and winter will be, uh, but no uh, attempt to hint at the, well, coincidence that as soon as the autumn booster campaign starts, uh, case numbers are uh, coming back up again. Um, so uh, uh, we'll leave it there for today because we're absolutely out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank Patrick and uh, Vanessa for joining us today. Uh, we'll be back for a little bit of extra if you're on the main UK column live stream in a couple of minutes. Um, but otherwise, uh, we'll see you at 1pm as usual on Monday. I hope everyone has a great weekend. See you then. Bye-bye.